So, so thanks for that introduction, Greg, and thanks for inviting me to speak, uh, speak to this group. I'm uh, excited to uh, offer you uh, what lessons I can from, from my own career. And like Greg said, I'm uh, at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and I, I am an infectious disease physician there primarily, and that's sort of why I live in the world of viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, and worms, or, or you know, what, I, what I like to call them, uh, my, a few of my favorite things, and this is about things that you value, and I, I kind of oddly value viruses, bacteria, fungi, and worms. Um, and I'm going to really talk about the value that I got from un really pursuing something that I was passionate about and then becoming an expert advisor on a lot of these issues. And uh, are anybody, is anybody here a pre-med student or anything like that thinking about pre-med? A couple. So this is going to be a more general, general lecture. So it will be, there will be st lessons there for people who are doing pre-med and there will be lessons that could be generalizable to anything for, that you could really think about from my experience and my ups and downs and the obstacles I faced. and. <clears throat> and what, uh, what's, what strengths I relied on, all of that can be applied to any, any career. And I think it's the reason I think that they invited me to talk is I, because of what I do with infectious disease. It's something di different, it's something unique, and it draws on a lot of different uh, qualities and, and attributes that might be useful generally. So um, just a couple other housekeeping. that You can follow me on Twitter. I do talk about infectious disease type related stuff there, and I have a blog called Tracking Zebra, and if you want, I can explain that to you at the end what that, what that means uh, if you're interested in these types of topics. So I'm going to start with, with, the, with the beginning, and with, with, with me, um, why did I get interested in medicine? Why do I like what I like? Both my parents were physicians, but that wasn't really why I went into medicine. They actually swayed me against it. Uh, they wanted me to explore other things, and they thought that, that medicine was changing and it wouldn't be the same as it was when they were practicing. But, what, but I had to think, you know, what, what did I like, what did I didn't like, and I actually didn't go into medicine first. That's a, that's a lesson. I think that you can take what Dr. Brooks said yesterday in his talk about experimenting as something that I myself did. I actually went to, I went to Carnegie Mellon University and I majored in, in finance or industrial management, which is really technical business uh, math and business kind of mushed together. And I did it and I liked it, but I started to work a little bit after I finished and I didn't find myself completely intellectually challenged. I, find my, I literally found myself sitting at my desk reading biology books, chemistry books, rushing home to watch the, the TV show ER, if you, if you are, are familiar with that. And medicine was always in my face and it was something I always liked. And then the other thing that, that really happened was that, you know, I started to really feel torn between two different fields. I thought that this is something that I, I really like the business stuff and I really liked the, I, I like uh, medicine, but I had to make a decision eventually because medicine is a long range type of thing and you can't wait too long to do it, especially what you wanted to do. And I kept coming back to this book that I'd read as a child. I don't know if any of you had seen it. It's called, a, it's a value tale. And I kind of plug this book all the time. It's the value of believing in yourself. And it sounds kind of corny, but it is actually the story of Louis Pasteur. It has a great lesson about believing in yourself, which is good for a child. But I was also drawn to the, just the actual facts of this story of Louis Pasteur and how he discovered the rabies vaccine. And I, when I was a child, my parents would read it to me over and over and over and over again. And I actually got to the point where I could turn the, I knew when the, when the page would turn because I had memorized the book. So I always thought infectious disease were really cool because this guy was talking about invisible enemies and invaders. And I thought this is something that I, I was always thought if I wanted to be a doctor, that was something I wanted to be, be in. And the other thing that I would just give credit to is, is my, my parents, because I, I often think of this weird scenario when I was a, a child and I, I went, I got sent to Catholic school and Catholic school is the only private school in my little town and I was getting kind of pushed with all this religion which I didn't really understand because I wasn't, I was grown up secular and I, my mom, I asked my mom once, I was, she was doing her laundry or something and I walked downstairs and I said, do you believe in God? And she said this to me. And I, I always think, I don't like to give my mom credit for much, but I, <laughs> I give her credit for this uh, thing. She said, I believe in my own might. And I think that kind of gelled with what I was reading in that little pasture book as a child. And that's kind of something that I carry with me now, that if I want to do something, I'm going to take the required actions, learn what I need to do, and actually go forward and, and do that. And that's something that I, that I, that I draw on a lot, is uh, believing in my own, my own might. So... Why, why did I like infectious diseases and how did I choose that, that of all the different fields of, of medicine and all of the ones that are much more lucrative or much more, you know, you know, r rushing into surgery or, or doing transplants or, or taking care of trauma patients, that, why did I think infectious disease was the most interesting? And I think it comes to the fact that I really love the detective work. Infectious disease is a lot of detective work. You have to ask people where they were, who they were with, what do they do, what are their pets, what, what kind of hobbies do you have, 
why did you, what, what different, what did you do different? And I love teasing all apart that, that type of stuff. And I, when I was a child, I really liked things like, you know, detective stories and, and Sherlock Holmes or, or um, you know, even to maybe to date myself like the Scooby, even Scooby-Doo cartoons I thought were awesome because they were trying to figure out a mystery, like the Hardy Boys. Um, you know, as I got older, I really, I, I still have a, a fond affinity for the Ghostbusters who are like these really, these geniuses who are saving the world by using their mind to try to solve these problems, albeit they're supernatural problems, but the lesson is kind of that, that people that are smart can figure out mysteries that other people can't, and I thought that was really fun. And I also, you know, Indiana Jones is another inspiration when I was a child because this was this professor one minute, and then the other minute he's, he's you know, looking for relics and, and fighting Nazis and things like that. So I thought that's like, what, and that's, that would be a really fun job to be in some kind of position where you're dealing with, you know, you might have a normal life giving a lecture today and then tomorrow you're sitting in some, you're dealing with some infectious disease that nobody has seen before. That, that's really cool to me. And you know, so just for some popular cultures, popular culture references, there's a quote here, solving puzzles, saving lives is collateral damage. So when you, when it's like a cliche when you interview someone going to medical school that they want to help people or they want to, they want to be this, uh, you know, martyr, but I think the most interesting part about medicine for me is solving the puzzles and saving lives is collateral damage. And that was said by somebody else who they described as some doctors have the Messiah complex. They need to save the world. You've got the Rubik's complex. You need to solve the puzzle. And I don't know if you guys know who that is, but that's a uh, house uh, who is a, a, re a kind of like a, I was already in my career when, when his uh, show, when his show was uh, on, but he really uh, crystallized a lot of the attraction to infectious disease into medicine for me as somebody like that. that he may not be the doctor that you want, but he's the doctor sometimes that you need when you have horrible problems. And it's something that uh, I think those two quotes really uh, exemplify what infectious disease is like for me. And, and one other quote from a, a very famous infectious disease doctor named Hans Zinser. I kind of plug this everywhere. It's a long quote, but it really talks about why infectious disease is this Indiana Jones type of uh, opportunity for people. It's one of the few genuine adventures left in the world. The dragons are dead, and the lance grows rusty in the chimney corner. About the only sporting proposition that remains unimpaired by the relentless domestication of a once free living human species is the war against those ferocious little fellow creatures, which lurk in dark corners and stalk us in the bodies of rats, mice, and all kinds of domestic animals which fly and crawl with the insects and waylay us in our food and drink and even in our love. So I think that's just, it just tells you what infectious disease does. It really encompasses all of the world. We've gotten very far in civilization, but there, we're still dealing with certain infectious disease problems as I'll get to later in the talk. So this is something that uh, is, I think is an inspiring quote. So I make this decision that I want to go to medical school. I wanted to leave the business stuff and I, I kind of cleared it with my parents that I was going to do this. And so I started to take classes to, to meet my pre-read requirements and I'm applying and I, I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh. I know everybody in Pittsburgh. My parents are doctors in Pittsburgh. I think, you know, I'm going to go to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center or Medical School and I'm going to apply uh, early decision and all that stuff. So I don't really apply very widely. I get a, a good MCAT score, um, but then I get rejected and then I don't know what to do. Um, so I'm like scrambling to apply to some other places. So I'm dealing with this, you know, this is what I want to do. This is, I completely want to do this. I know I can do it but now I've got rejected. What, what, do I, what do I do? And I start scrambling to apply to other places and I'm not getting very, having much success with any, any of the schools. Pennsylvania, if you, medical schools are very balkanized in the sense that whatever state you're a resident of, it's very difficult to, certain states have different policies and it sometimes Pennsylvania is not the best state to be from. Um, so I couldn't get in and I had to think, what am I gonna do now? Um, so I started looking at some of the, the Caribbean medical schools, and there's a lot of stigma to going to a Caribbean medical school. So I had to make a decision. Am I going to go to a, a Caribbean medical school and have a little bit of stigma to get away from versus just giving this whole idea up, this dream that I want to be this infectious disease doctor? So I decide to go to um, a place called the American University in the Caribbean, which is in St. Martin, and it looks like that some days. And the thing with Caribbean medical schools is, is this is kind of an interesting story, is that you, they let, U.S. medical schools barely let anybody in, but nobody can ever fail out. You will, get a, you, will, you will graduate no matter what from medical school. They don't fail people out of a U.S. medical school. A Caribbean medical school takes the opposite approach. They will let you in, but you will not come out of there unless you actually deserve to come out of there because they don't want a defective product out on the on a market with their name. So I started with 120 people in my class, and I ended with 53. I finished first in my class, but it was a complete winnowing and narrowing, and I knew that I had to go there 
and really do different do things differently so I wouldn't have stigma because I wanted to be this academic medical doctor. And you might see people that go if you want to be a family medicine doctor or a pediatrician, you might find that you can go to a Caribbean medical school and that might be something that can that can that won't really stigmatize you. But if you want to be at what University of Pittsburgh Medical Center where I work now is the number 13 medical center in the country, it's it's a little bit hard. So I knew I had to do well and you know, you're on this Caribbean island, there's lots of distractions, and there's distractions like this as well, which um, I had five of those to deal with when I was there, so it's not all idyllic and, and fun there. You have, when you have to live there during five hurricanes, you really understand, uh, you know, like the Martian, that's kind of what, the, what that, the, <laughs> the microcosm of what, how nature can be when you don't know, uh, when you're in an area that's not well equipped. So what did I do in, the, in that medical school, or what kind of traits did I draw on? So I knew I was going to be coming, I was going to be coming, applying for residencies and fellowships at places where people were going to be coming from Harvard and Yale and places like that where I would have a, a huge disadvantage. So I knew I had to be better than them uh, in order to make people actually look at me, just to look at me, let alone take, and then I'd have to sell it based on my interview. So a lot of stuff that happened there. I had to be extremely productive. I really worked hard to make sure that I understood this material that I was learning, that I was scoring the highest on every test that I could. I, the USMLE step one and step two are kind of your barometers that go with you for a long time, and I scored in the 99th percentile on both of those, which, is, which was put me into the upper echelon of everybody in the United States taking that, that test, which opened doors for me and it was only because I really had this goal in mind and was thinking long range that I don't want to just get to get through this I want to think I'm looking not at what I was what, not just finishing this test or this class or or this semester I was looking at what am I going to be doing 15 years from now how am I going to have that how am I going to reach that goal of being this academic infectious disease doctor without and without and looking at all the, the little steps that I had to take all along the way and build upon them so I was very consciously thinking long range uh, and, and not thinking about just the test or not and I actually I was fam famous for not studying 48 hours before a test because I thought you know I either I have to know this material not for the test so 48 hours before the test I'm not I'm just going to take it easy because I've been studying for it the whole time um, but people thought that was me being like cavalier it was just because I was really had a plan of how I was going to learn the material and I didn't want to be uh, studying 48 hours before the test I'd rather have a good night's sleep and not cram and that was because I was thinking long range because it wasn't like I was studying this biochemistry for the test on Friday I was studying this biochemistry for what I will be using it for 15 years later. Um, self-esteem, I knew that I had, so the self-esteem came from the fact that I was confident in my mind's ability to, to handle this material, to understand what was, uh, what, what I was being taught and to realize what its place was and that, and when you have that confidence and when you have that ability to think about it, self-esteem naturally um, will start to accrue, especially when you're, when you're doing well on the test and you're, do, and, you're, and you're getting good positive feedback from yourself that you're actually mastering the material. So that was something that kept me going, that I knew that I could do this. Um, and all of this went, went hand in hand with self-efficacy. I was mastering the material. I understood the material. I was making integrations that made me feel that I could do this and that, that this wasn't some kind of pipe dream coming from a Caribbean medical school going to, uh, trying to get into a really, uh, um, in, into a really prestigious residency and fellowship. And I was very intense. Most people thought of me that time as somebody that was kind of one-track mind. I wasn't really thinking so much about anything other than trying to get to where I, where I got to. And I, I had this central purpose that I was trying to achieve and, and, and integrate everything around. And that, that uh, gave people the impression that I was, that, you know, the correct impression that I had a lot of intensity and a lot of focus as well. And, and the other thing that I did is that I thought that if I did all this stuff well in a, in a and really uh, prove myself to myself and had objective evidence of what I do, that, that the rationality of others would, would, would follow through and people would judge me objectively. They would say, yeah, maybe he went to a Caribbean school, but that's probably an interesting story more than any kind of black mark on him. And that's sort of what it became was people were like, wow, what happened here? Um, the, how did this, how did we overlook him? And, you know, and it's really interesting now because I got rejected from the University of Pittsburgh as a student, as a medical student. But now I'm faculty there teaching the same medical students I wasn't able to, <laughs> to, to be. So I think it's kind of a total 360 degree turn, which is, I think, uh, uh, you know, a funny uh, story for me. It's a, it's a funny thing to say to people because it's uh, now I'm teaching you, but I, couldn't, I wasn't able to be you, but now I'm responsible for teaching you, uh, which is very strange. So after I, so I graduated from, from medical school in, in 2002, and I wanted to be an infectious disease doctor, and I thought, I didn't want to just be a regular infectious disease doctor. I really wanted to be an expert. And what I did is 
actively try to think about how could I be different than a lot of just not the run of the mill infectious disease doctor, be kind of like, sort of like Indiana Jones, uh, but not completely. But uh, so what I did is I applied for a double residency in internal and emergency medicine. So I wanted to know uh, how infectious diseases might happen in an emergency department, how they would, would, would uh, appear there. And then I also, then I, did, then I did my formal infectious disease training and then a year of critical care. So that was, that ended up being like eight years extra after medical school. A normal infectious disease doctor would probably do about five because I wanted to be an expert. I wanted to really niche myself and have a, special, a specialized knowledge because I loved the material. So I didn't think of it as time that I was wasting, waiting to get out there. I was already out there because I'd been there in my mind for a long time. And this really, uh, all this training gave me the ability to you know, cultivate my experience and give me a 360 degree view of the problem because I can talk about an infectious disease from the emergency room standpoint, from the ICU standpoint, and from the, the proper infectious disease, you know, as infectious disease doctor proper. That gave me a really, uh, uh, an important uh, perspective that came in, came in use as, as, we, as, uh, you know, as I grew in my career. I wanted to have the amount of training that I wanted. I didn't want it to be set by some, some type of uh, rule that, you know, most infectious disease doctors just do an internal medicine residency and three years of, uh, two years of infectious disease training. I wanted to be not your, you know, not your average infectious disease doctor. And what ended up happening is I got, I, I started, it ended up really um, creating a niche for myself because at that time, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center buys this think tank from the Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and it's called the Center for Biosecurity. And it's basically the premier think tank that works on problems like pandemic preparedness, emerging infectious diseases, bioterrorism, biological weapons, catastrophic health events, anything big and bad, and, we kinda, and, and very integrated with some of the government functions with the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, the CDC. And the University of Pittsburgh bought that, and it was just a almost like falling into my lap when I was like an infectious disease fellow. So I got the opportunity to as a fellow to start going down to bulk driving from Pittsburgh to Baltimore and really, really delving into these interesting areas that I thought were um, fascinating to me and really brought into everything I was interested in, all this national security stuff, all the geopolitics, all mixed together with infectious disease. It's kind of a really fun sandwich that I got myself put into. And I, and I really thrived in there. And, and, voraciously devoured anything that I could to learn about it and really tried to carve out a, a niche for myself. And that niche, because it was so unique, it created a huge opportunity because I was basically competing with myself because there was, I'd make myself so kind of specialized and had such a specialized font of knowledge by that time that opportunities just arose because I happened to be one of the only people where all these things intersect. Uh, and that created an ability for me to really move forward in my career and for other people to actually reach out to me, recognize me, put me on panels, put me on a, a lot of stuff. And, and it was so obvious to me, and it was so obvious to anybody it, when I would say that. But when you go back to an academic medical center and you go sit down with the chairman and tell him that, this is what he tells me. Uh, you're unfocused. Um, in this big meeting, he tells me this, you're unfocused. It's kind of like, a, um, it's almost like, a, you know, n not really, but like the fountainhead in the very first scene when, with work and the dean, where he does, they just can't understand what he's, what, what he's offering. And, and I'm trying to tell the division chief, I'm not on focus. I'm the most focused person you probably have dealt with, and you just can't see it that way because you think he's got specializations in a few different things. He's kind of all over the place thinking about anthrax one day and thinking about pandemic flu the other day, where everybody in academic medicine is so hyper-specialized that they only work on, you know, diabetic foot fungus only, basically, or just work on one, just tuberculosis or just HIV. And that was a whole paradigm shift, but I said, this is, I, I'm not on focus, and and I had to actually have the courage there to say what I thought, what the vision, what my central purpose was, what the vision was for my career, and then have to deal with the consequences of him not actually wanting to, um, not want, not actually getting it, but you know, kind of standing, having the respect to stand out, to step out of my way, and just let me fail on my own or do do what I wanted to do on my own, and that's sort of what what I did uh, there. To the point where you know, next next things that happen to me, people telling me you're overqualified for this position. When I applied for certain positions, that you've already done all this stuff, you're so niched and specialized. There's nothing we can train you. Uh, th this you're going to be bored here. Uh, so that that's actually a good thing to have, but that's something that happened um, to me. And then I would say over the you know the ensuing years after my infectious disease fellowship was a lot of persistence and steady progress where I was getting involved in projects, writing papers, thinking big, trying to plan out what I was going to do, thinking long range all the time of what the next big thing is, what's the next project, how can I get involved in this, how can I integrate two things that people think are, are, are very different. 
And at that time, because of this, I was starting to get some, some attention from the media, some attention from, from you know, major people in the field because I was niched, because I had a little bit of a track record at that point. And then basically um, the Ebola outbreak happened in the end of 2013, 2014, and I call that lightning striking, and lightning can be good and can be bad, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And you know, during this, I had to go on almost every, ra every radio and news show in the country, and, in, and a lot of them internationally as well, where I basically was on CNN for 30 days straight um, about a month, about a year ago, uh, exactly, and I had to go on places like the O'Reilly Factor, which is not a fun, uh, uh, fun thing to do. I really had to do, I, I was being relied upon as a non-governmental expert, talk, doing crisis communication to the general public, which can be really hard because there are very, during Ebola, there were a lot of absurd questions about zombie apocalypse, about, about US military going to kill people in, in Africa, about you know, this spreading everywhere, people buying Tyvek suits in, 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 in the United States, people doing a lot of crazy stuff, and you had to calm that down. So I had to really understand how to communicate knowledge, and I had to really try to become an expert on the fly, I was, I had the subject matter expertise, but I had to figure out how do I translate that to the general public or to policymakers. And I had to kind of learn it on, on the fly and try to figure out what, what the best principles were, what works, and a lot of that drew from me talking to patients so much, and I think that helped that I still worked clinically all this time that I was developing this expertise. I was still seeing patients, so I knew how to explain a disease to a patient or explain a disease to a, a patient's family. Um, and I had to really think about the fact that we, you know, I had to, I, there are certain things that you have to criticize during during that kind of an outbreak, but you want to make sure that you're, you know, you're rewarding competence. You're 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 pointing out when things are being done competently, even if there are problems. And you really were try at this point trying not to allow more damage to occur, especially when you had people getting quarantined outside in a tent outside of a, a airport in New Jersey, and and people doing a lot of crazy things that weren't really science based. So it was really interesting. And I have a, a quick little video that gives you not to. Um, not to um, be too uh, self-congratulatory, but they made this little thing just to give you, uh, I don't know if I can get this to work. Let me see if this, if this all works. But this just like 10 seconds or 15 seconds that the University of Pittsburgh eventually, some parts of it uh, were very happy with me, but let me see if this works. I don't know, sound, I don't think, or... So wait, I was just, and it's not gonna work. But I was just basically, they, they just put a montage of me on every show, which I thought was eventually, these people who thought I was unfocused and everything then said, this is really great, where I'm talking on um, every, uh, basically, news story for a while, and it became completely crazy. Um, it's weird kind of watching them there because it's just a lot of different uh, opportunities I got to, to talk and learn on the, on the fly. Um, there, I was really tired that day, I think, but I, I, <laughs> I, I <laughs> Uh, that sometimes I would do like 20 interviews a day, and uh, let me get this. So it was, um, it really was lightning striking. And, and you know, when you think about the role of experts, I know this is the subtitle of the talk. I'm kind of giving you the whole career thing of, of, of what I did. Experts are really essential to have during a crisis, and you have to know the limits of the expert. And so not all of you are going to be experts in medicine, but you might be experts in something else, but you're also going to be consuming information from experts every day. When you turn on the TV, when you read the newspaper, how do you know what is that expert saying to you? Is it, is it true? Is it something I need to investigate? Is it something I need to take action on now because you know, I bought this car seat and this expert is telling me I'm going to kill my child? How do you evaluate that information? You have to, you have to know what the expert's limits are and realize that experts are not the authority, that we're, we're advisors. We're trying to give you the best information we have to help you make a decision. And, it's no, and, and experts can be wrong. And, I, and I, here I, I like to plug Alex Epstein's book, The Moral Co Case for Fossil Fuels, and, which is about fossil fuels, and, uh, fossil fuels, and it's a great book to read, but he also has this interesting thing there because there are a lot of experts in his field where the, what they're saying might not be actually true or might be wrong or cause people to make horrible policy decisions. And, and he talks about an expert, you have, to be, you have to be clear with an expert on what he knows and, what he, and how he knows it, as well as, he, as what he doesn't know. And that's something you don't often see with experts is sometimes they might not tell you what they do and what they don't. And I tried, every time I was on there saying, I don't understand why this happened, why this person in Dallas got infected with, th those two nurses got infected in, in Ebola. I still don't know why they got infected. I don't know how the NBC cameraman got infected. There's, I don't know why this new nurse in Scotland relapsed. There's lots of things I don't know. But I do know what I do know about Ebola, and this is how I know it, because we've had 25 uh, outbreaks of Ebola. This is what we've done. They've stopped every time when we've done this. So 
I try to outline, and that's important when you're giving expert advice that you don't just make, you just don't pontificate and, and make people uh, really try to believe you on, almost on faith. You have to actually reduce what you're saying. And you, and you have to say what you don't know, explicitly say, I don't know. It's, I think it's okay to say that, and it's hard as an expert sometimes to say that. You don't wanna say it, but you, are, you get, gain much more credibility when you say, we don't know all the answers here. Uh, there's important questions to be done. And I actually said that on the O'Reilly Factor. He didn't even hear me say that. He just ran right over what I said and continued to criticize everything. But I said, I don't know why the NBC cameraman got infected. It's important that we find these answers out. And then he didn't hear me say that. Uh, but he went, it's, a, it's a fun YouTube to watch from October 14, 2014 of him uh, yelling at me. Uh, the other thing is an expert, I, I try to integrate. I say, you know, you know this about Ebola, but you know this about measles. Measles is the most contagious. So I did, so for example, when the measles outbreak at Disneyland occurred, I was back on CNN saying, you know, you were all asking me about Ebola, how contagious it was. And I said, this is a disease that's very contagious. Ebola was not very contagious. This is the difference. What I told you that back during Ebola, that, that measles is the most contagious disease known to humans. Ebola is not the most contagious disease known to humans. So I try to integrate. I also try to reduce to the perceptual levels. Like when you see this or when you do what, 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 what actual actions do they see in their daily life that, that support the point I'm making? And, and that's also important, is that you try to get this down to the, as simple a level as possible so that people can actually comprehend what you're, uh, what you're saying. And you need to be able to answer all questions. Uh, that's important too, and be, it's okay to say, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that question, or, or this is where you might find the source that I haven't looked at, or I'll, I'll get back to you. But you need to be able to not be evasive uh, when you're being an expert and be able to answer as much as, as you possibly can. So that's sort of what I did. You know, that's kind of my little bit on, on what I think of, of experts and, and how I try to act myself. And I talked about lightning being good, but it also can burn because this is something interesting that happened to me, which is not part of the story that's, I don't, I've never really said it so much about it publicly, but during this time, I'm at this big, at, at a big medical center that is, you know, $10 billion in revenue, the biggest employer in the state uh, that I live in. And I was getting a lot of attention and I, at that time, I got named to be the, the spokesperson for the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is a major organization of all the infectious disease doctors in the country, which is like 10,000 people. And the university, parts of the university didn't necessarily like that because then I was outside of their chain of command, outside of their control, and it became a very, very bad problem because they didn't want me to talk on Ebola, but that's what, I, that's what was going on day in and day out, 25 interviews, and they're saying, you just need to stop, and you can't, and I was actually, enjoying it. It was something that I wanted to do. This is where I'm now at the pinnacle of, of what I've been trying to achieve, to be an infectious disease expert, actually influencing policy, doing stuff, and they telling me to pull back. And I had to make this decision, you know, what am I going to do? And people said, you know, don't, don't be a martyr. Don't, don't martyr yourself over this. And I said this, um, I'm going to go forward with this because it, I care about my career. I think this is the right decision to make. And the universe, this is all they can do to me. They can, they can take my skateboard. If they can't get, take my skateboard, can't delete my iPod, um, they're not going to be able to hurt me. I made this decision that I wanted to do what I thought was right and take the consequences. If the university didn't like what I was doing, they, they, they had ways to deal with me that way. But I had to make a decision on what I was going to do. And in the end, you know, during this, I was, you know, really, again, coming back to, ind I was independently thinking about this, thinking long range, what am I going to be doing? What, what would happen? What, would I be able to live with the consequences if, if I just, you know, kind of, caved in and, you know, just were willing to go with the flow, like Greg said, or, you know, thinking that this was really going to be a sacrifice if I did this, and I wasn't going to, to sacrifice something so important to me, and I wasn't, if I agreed to it, I really wasn't taking my own life and my own goals that I had been, been uh, highlighting for so many years seriously, and, you know, I think I had this moral certainty that what I was doing was correct, and, you know, people are saying, you're being too consistent, and things like that. There's a little, there's direct uh, quotes to people, the people that were saying to me, you know, I think, you know, Dr. Brooke yesterday talked about, you know, uh, Howard Rourke going to the quarry, and I think that's what I thought, you know, if I have to go to the quarry, I'll go to the quarry. Uh, it's, it's something that I, this is what I want to do, and I'm thinking long range and not just what's going to happen after this Ebola outbreak. But what happened was I said, okay, and then they, I actually stood up for what I believed, and they said, okay, just don't use our title, don't use the title, um, and just stay out of the Pittsburgh press. And I said, okay, that's an okay compromise. I won't, I won't be in the Pittsburgh press. I'll do the national and international press. And what ended up happening is inside the university that it became kind of well known what was going on there then. And, and this is kind of a cl cliche thing because this is you know, sponsored by somewhat the undercurrent, but it really was all these people became my fans, these allies that I had all over the place in the press, in the university, in the medical center that really um, 
uh, helped me and, and came to my defense telling me, you know, you're doing your job, everybody knows you're doing your job right. Um, the, you, the, the people that could actually gave me more money. They did all kinds of stuff that they could do to encourage me not to, to continue doing what I was doing. Although there were certain people that, that, that were obstacles and were basically, you know, one of my colleagues told me, there's just going to be people in your life that aren't gonna let you do your job. And you just have to do your job and, and, and do it. And, and that's something that I, that, uh, you know, that person was part of that underground stream. And it was interesting because the press then in Pittsburgh figured out, out what happened. And then they rose to my defense. And at January, they named me, they put me on the front page of the paper, named me the, uh, one of the top five people in the, in the state to watch. And you could see that, you know, the, the, on this picture, the, um, the governor is, uh, down here, so the, the new governor, I, I ranked, outranked the new governor of Pennsylvania, which was pretty good, uh, and I don't like him either, Tom Wolf. I can say that on camera. Um, uh, so so that, that, this really was another validation that when you do stick to what you're doing, when you have a long range goal, you can um, really think, of, you can really make a lot of progress and, and get to, to where you want to go. And you know, it's odd, I'm giving you career advice, but I'm always myself soliciting career advice and solic all the time trying to figure out what's, what's next or how do I do this better. And it's something that's continuous. In the last, couple, in the last uh, part of the talk, I was asked a little bit to talk about um, the current, and this is more for the pre-meds here, the current context of healthcare and, and what I think of it and what my predictions are. And I did a panel at, at Ocon last year that you, with uh, Peter Laporte, which is probably going to be available soon uh, to listen to where we go into more detail. But, you know, I work in this high charged area of healthcare, which isn't the same as everybody else's, what, what your normal experience of healthcare is. It, I'm sort of protected from a lot of it because I work in a, in a tertiary care center seeing really sick patients in a highly specialized center. But healthcare is, you know, very, very controlled by the government. And that's important because when you're thinking about how you want to plan your career, you have to think, is the road to achievement open for you there? And when does it become too much to do? And healthcare, for the most part, is I would say 60% socialized at least right now because of uh, Medicare and Medicaid, the VA system, all of that, that's government control. And you don't have that autonomy as this, you know, you see the country doctor who kind of walks from house to house doing house calls, doing really cool things, or you don't necessarily get to do that anymore because you are filling out papers, you are, you, there's certain things that are restricted, you're dealing with an insurance company which basically is an arm of the government and, and many, for many intents and purposes has been so heavily regulated that they're, they're like the government. And most of the people in my field are not political or ideological allies. Um, I, I, I usually stand alone uh, disagreeing with people on certain things. You know, for example, I don't know where everybody stands on this issue, but you know, recently a, a, a pharmaceutical company raised its drug price very, very high, uh, Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Um, they bought an, an unpatented drug and raised the price very high and got a lot of criticism in the media, had Hillary Clinton talking about him. Uh, and it was an HIV medication. So I'm the spokesperson for the Infectious Disease Society of America. So they asked me, will you go on TV and talk about this? And I said, I don't have the same position as you. I disagree. I think that I'm not jumping on this bandwagon to, to crucify this, uh, this CEO who did what was completely legal, completely, fine, completely right. It may, have been, it may have been a bad business decision, but they're you know, basically calling to you know, have him publicly executed because he raised a price like that. And, I actually, and I said, and what you're going to do is you're, it, it leads to price controls. And I made this statement to these people and, and they, they said, we, we, we get it, we understand and thank you for actually saying that to us because we didn't think of it that way. And um, that was something, you know, the, the political capital I had built up by being a good spokesperson, by being a good expert allowed me to be able to openly say that this is, you know, against the entire group of infectious disease physicians and, and, and basically the world that th I'm not going to, I'm not going to jump onto this, uh, you know, put, put throwing this guy on the fire because he raised a, raised a drug price. I, I said, I'll talk about why the drug prices are so high. Why is there only one, one, uh, one um, manufacturer and what this means for innovation in, in pharmaceuticals? Um, and I did do that, but I wouldn't come out, I wouldn't sign the letter saying, you know, this was bad. And the thing is that, you know, healthcare trends are worsening. I don't think that you see anything, I don't see any golden opportunity here that, that's going to get better. I think it's going to probably get worse before it gets better. Uh, nobody has an alternative. The, both part, one party, you know, wants to increase the, uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act's provisions, while the other one wants to scale it back a little bit, but, but, but likes a lot of the stuff in it that actually 
would actually probably make the whole thing wreck if some of the Republican plans would happen, I think, because of the, because what they would take out, there's little, it's almost like a, that game Jenga, and you pull little things out, the whole thing is going to collapse quicker. But I, I don't see this getting better uh, faster. There are good trends like concierge medicine, but it is very highly restricted and regulated, by the way, who can be a concierge doctor, where you, you don't work with insurance companies, you don't work with hospitals. But that can't really be for everybody because you can't be a, a, a transplant surgeon or an infectious disease physician and be a concierge physician, concierge doctor because you need to work in a hospital and hospitals have to take Medicare and as soon as they take Medicare then you can't be a concierge medicine. So th that's kind of my, my negative view on, 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 on the current context in healthcare. But so what do I what do I do? It's because I really think that I still have this intellectual curiosity. You can't really Infectious disease are going to happen no matter if we're in a controlled healthcare system or not. And I'm really interested in those puzzles and solving those puzzles and this intellectual curiosity. You know, the little child that keeps asking why, why, why that <clears throat> that was me, and that's that's still me. So I always want to know what's going on. Why did this infection occur? Why did this disease outbreak occur? What does this mean? Why did this drug not work? That's what really what, what I really think about. And I have this active mind where I'm trying to constantly figure out why this is happening, integrate it with what I know figure out where there's contradictions and try to figure out why does this not make sense? Why did it, why is, what doesn't make sense or what's not right? And that really keeps me going and I would do it probably, you know, it's, I found something that I really love and, uh, you know, I just, and I, I, I like to push and challenge myself and I have this ambition just to keep working to the, to the top level all the time and that's sort of where I find infectious disease gives me those challenges and, you know, I just had like my um, year, year review, year review at, uh, at, my, at the center I work at and, my, the CEO of our center said, you are obsessed with this stuff. <clears throat> so that, I think that's good when, when, you, when the person who signs your checks says you're obsessed with it and thinks it's a good thing. Because what, I think what he was trying to say is that you're internally motivated. We know that you're going to do this stuff because you like it so much. Other people have to be prodded along and do things. You're going to be doing this even when you're not here, when you're sleeping, when you're at home, when you're, when you're at lunch. So I'm, I'm, I think the, the, I picked a topic that I really think is, is really interesting and, and allowed it to make a central purpose. I, ha I have a central purpose, and, and that is to, you know, to explore and, and, and work on infectious disease. And I think that I'm pursuing my values. And I think you heard Dr. Brooke yesterday talk about love and values, and that might sound kind of cheesy, and, 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 but, but it is. You're pursuing things you love, and if you love infectious disease or if you love you know, computer science or you love philosophy or you love whatever you do, you, you're, you're motivated by that love because you're pursuing that, that value, and that's what I'm trying to do. Is I think you know, it might be weird to love you know, tapeworms, but in a sense I do uh, love tapeworms and love fleas and love lice and, and you know, you know, Dr. Salmeri's wife said, you, you're writing about mold so much that no one's ever going to like you once she sold, but she's very, she's very blunt. Uh, she's a physician too, but she told me that. You're putting too much about mold on Facebook, she told me. Um, but uh, so I, I, do, I think it's really interesting and fascinating. Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm not willing to go with the flow and, and I think that, that, that looking and, and figuring out odd answers are, are what's really been fueling me this entire uh, my entire career. So, you know, that, that's a formal part of the question. I'm happy to, uh, my, of my talk. I'm happy to take any and all questions about what I talked about here. Any infectious disease burning questions you have, literally burning, or maybe, or, or, uh, um, or, or just that are burning in your mind. So, thanks for your attention. Um, again, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter or read my blog if you're interested in that. And that's a picture of me skateboarding on my 38th birthday. So, uh, that's well, that's one other thing I love since I was a child is skateboarding, which also goes again, doesn't go with the flow usually. It's a uh, you get, you get used to being harassed for being a skateboarder as well. So thank you for your attention. I hope you found that useful, and I'm happy to take any and all questions, and feel free to email me if you uh, have other questions that come up. Thank you. Yes. I think the primary health care will probably change dramatically. That's where kind of the rubber meets the road with a lot of these policies because they are the prime, they're by, because they're, they're primary, so they are the, the frontline clinical doctors and that's what, you know, when you think about the Affordable Care Act and what it's meant to, to the problem it's meant to fix is getting people with health insurance. So once you get, you know, this 47 million people that didn't have health insurance now have government health insurance, they all go to primary care physicians. So, primary, so what that's already causing is a shortage of primary care physicians. So primary care physicians tend to be very overworked. And now there's going to be more, because of that, now the government is creating certain incentives to encourage primary care, you know, encourage meaning that they actually end up distorting it a little bit because now everyone is going to start going into primary care uh, medicine in order to 
get these little perks like loan, re loan repayment, tax advantages, uh, and that's going to, I think, eventually cause a, it's going to be like a boom bust cycle, like you see in everything else. They're going to be there's too few primary care. They're going to be too big, too few. But you do have to deal. The day to day practice of primary care physician is going to be a lot of checking boxes, following guidelines, making sure that you're doing the the correct the correct things that are coming from you know guideline committees and not all the art of medicine may end up getting pulled out of uh, primary care medicine. There's going to be people that still enjoy it and still do it well, but it's going to be increasingly harder to do it because you're going to be measured with, you know, there's words like comparative effectiveness research, which sounds really good and in a certain sense does pull out good things, but it also is going to be a way to say, you know, how well do you do against your peers? And you're going to have your data very micromanaged by people, whoever the payer may be, and I think ultimately it's going to be a single, they're going to move towards a single payer. That's, that's I think, inevitable at this point. Uh, it, it's going to be very hard. You're going to be, you know, the, uh, almost like a bean counter for th for them, making sure that you check all the boxes. So it's not a very promising. It's not one of the promising fields of of medicine, unless you really are compassionate uh, passionate about it, and you find a way to do it, like concierge medicine, where you can have people pay you cash, and you can be that old school doctor that does things, uh, th th you know, does right by their patients, and also is very independent. But it's very hard to be to do that outside of concierge medicine. Private practice doctors are disappearing. They're all being bought by hospitals and hosp by, being bought by hospitals. Hospitals are being bought by insurance companies. Insurance companies are merging. So it's basically all umbrella, putting everybody under one thing. So it becomes very easy for then uh, someone to pass a bill saying, well, insurance companies are going to be outlawed. We're going to make one big government insurance company because there's only six of you left anyway. So it, I, I do think the trends are pretty bad. And primary care hits it gets it hit hit the, the hardest. It's much harder to do it to a neurosurgeon uh, than it is to, uh, to a primary care physician because there's a lot more that can't be regimented for a neurosurgeon versus a, a primary care doctor. But it is a good field and, and it's actually horrible because that's most people's interaction with the healthcare system is their primary care doctor and you want the better your primary care doctor is the less you have to worry about people like me in general because you're not going to get to me because your primary care doctor is going to figure it out, get you the right vaccines, treat your infections appropriately, give you the right advice when you go traveling places, things like that. If you don't have that, if that fails, then, then that's when all of us come into play. Yes? Do you focus on just the diseases in the United States or do you focus on like worldwide? Because I know Ebola came to the United States, but when did you first get it? When did I first... Uh, Ebola. So, okay. So I focus on, on the world, basically. I think of myself as, you know, thinking about infectious diseases that happen all over the world because the world is small. People can travel from one side of the country, one side of the world to the other. So, you know, I've been kind of fascinated with Ebola. The first time I heard about it was probably maybe in the, in the mid-1990s. It first came out in 1976. But I started thinking about this Ebola outbreak in December of 2013 is when, the first, when there was these mystery cases in Guinea that nobody knew what it was. Because Guinea has very, very poor health infrastructure. They actually thought they were treating cholera until someone figured out, finally got them to a place where they could do the testing. And when they got the testing, they realized they had Ebola. So the outbreak had already had a three-month head start when it was in Guinea. So, but I had been, track, I, I track all of these weird infectious disease outbreaks even before they're identified just by looking at, at you know, uh, there's certain postings and certain social media outlets where people say, you know, weird disease and such and such, and I kind of keep those on my radar. So I'd been tracking Ebola for a while before it got the attention of the Western press. Yeah, go ahead. I like them all, yeah. <laughs> You know, she, she asked if I like the, the bigger diseases or the little diseases and if I like river blindness. I think river blindness is cool. That's uh, caused by a sand fly, bites you and puts a little worm in, in you and uh, can make you blind. It's not, I mean, it's probably horrifying to most people, but I think it's cool. But it's, uh, it's one that's actually slated to be uh, eliminated. It's one of, the, it's one of our t diseases that may eventually uh, disappear from the earth. Uh, and th and th those diseases are important because they keep these countries in sort of a poverty trap. That's a lot, a lot of the times they can't ever rise because the disease burden is so high. And you know, another plug for Alex Epstein's book and the moral case for fossil fuels, why do these countries have such horrible diseases? Most of them don't have important regular infrastructure like access to fossil fuels that allows the industrialization to occur, that allows them to have clean wa running water, allows them to have electricity to heat to keep their, so their food doesn't spoil, to have air conditioning, to shut their windows so they don't get bit by, by certain mosquitoes. All of that, I like to connect it back to, uh, I think that you know, Alex's book really uh, gives you that good, 
I think everybody that's in neglected tropical disease field should read Alex Epstein's book and understand why, why neglected tropical diseases occur in those countries that are completely a bereft of fossil fuels. I think that, so what the question is, how do you implement good healthcare in third world countries? In one way, they have it better because they don't have this huge behemoth infrastructure, so they can actually start things from the, 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 from the bottom up. And the other thing is that they have such, the, the bad part is that they have such a huge, tremendous burden of diseases, mostly chronic infectious diseases like malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, that they can't, that they can't you know, actually even pull themselves up enough to be able to even think about it because they're still dealing with these infectious diseases that have been eradicated other places. I do think that what you need to do is have a free market system in, in, these, in these countries, but they need to have a free market system in their whole countries. A lot of these third world countries are authoritarian with you know, basically dictatorships or tribal dictatorships where they don't have the, even the modicum of freedom. And that's what we saw with the Ebola outbreak is when the government said, you know, we have an Ebola outbreak, you need to do such and such and such and such. The people said, we don't, we don't believe you, you massacred us last week, we're not, or we, you know, you had a, we had a civil war, we don't believe anything you say, you tell us to do this and, and then you bring us, you, you slaughter us. So that's, I think healthcare in those countries is probably, you know, I think that they need to actually start to understand, you know, a philosophy of government properly before they can start to think about how they're going to have a healthcare industry because there it's so hard, to, it may be so hard to start a business, it may be so hard to, uh, to do anything with, in, with a minimal level of infrastructure. So I think first, the rule of law needs to be established in a lot of these countries, and then a, he a, pro then a healthy private healthcare sector can, can arise. But it's a, it's, a long, you know, it's, it's a long road, and I think it, sometimes we have people in the West giving advice to them, and I think they may end up not giving the best advice because they uh, sort of discount the fact that there's no, no rule of law in a lot of these countries. Yes? Okay, so the, the question was, what policies do we need to put in, in place in the United States uh, uh, to improve our healthcare system? As, and can those, can we have universal access to healthcare with, with those systems in place? So the first part of the question, what do we need to do? I think we need to deregulate health, health, the healthcare industry. For example, um, we, the majority buyer of healthcare is still the government. So I think there needs to be talk of, of privatizing slowly Medicare and, and Medicaid in order to allow people that have been, that, that have been you know, kind of raised on it to, and been on it and dependent upon it to, to wean themselves off. And I think there are plans to do that. That's one thing is to start to do that. The other thing is to allow private insurance to flourish. And that, there's a couple easy fixes that we could do. So for example, if a company gives you health insurance, that's deductible for that health, that, that company. They don't, why isn't it, but if you're self-employed and you buy your own health insurance, that's not deductible. Why don't we allow people to deduct their, the, the expenses they spend on health insurance so they're not dependent upon their em employer or the government for health insurance? So that's one thing, allowing tax, that's one simple solution, allowing tax deductibility of premiums. The other would be expansion of healthcare savings accounts. Why can't you take your, some of your money and put it into an account and let it accrue over time and that you use for your healthcare expenses. One of the problems with healthcare, the why, reason it costs so much is because nobody ever, nobody's, the, the doctor and the patient, neither one of them is touched by the price. They can just order whatever they want and the patient can get whatever they want and the government or, some, or the insurance company pays the price. So why not allow it to be more consumer driven where they're more price sensitive? Because, you know, just like it is for auto insurance, you know, why, you know, you don't expect your auto insurance to, to pay for you to have, you know, every oil change and everything that happens, but we do that with health insurance, and then you wonder why the cost of health care is, is so high. But those two things, tax deductibility, health care savings accounts, um, starting to think about ways to privatize Medicare to get people off of Medicare, uh, and, and with a voucher system maybe initially, th those are, there's a lot of... Uh, important steps that could be taken. And could you have universal access? Yes, you could. If you made healthcare, you have to, why, why don't people have, buy healthcare insurance? Because it's too expensive. And the reason it's expensive is because you can't tax deduct it, you can't do healthcare savings accounts, you have to buy these prescribed plans that are very expensive. So your plan, you may be a male, but your plan includes OBGYN coverage, which you're never gonna use. Um, so th there's, a, or infertility, there's a lot of things that are, that are mandated in plans that drive the price up, so we need to see if you removed all of these restrictions, you would see a flourishing of all sorts of hybrid plans that would probably fit anybody's budget and could increase universal uh, and allow people to have universal access to healthcare. And you would see, uh, you know, the rise of true charity care would also occur because because you would have 
you know, for people who didn't want to buy it or couldn't buy it or still couldn't afford even the cheap products, we've always seen, you know, people weren't dying in the street before Medicare and Medicaid. I think that's an important story. People, there, wa there was no crisis before that. It was just, it was a government program that they wanted. They didn't want people to actually have to think about making economic decisions based on their health care, and that's why Medicare was, was promulgated in the 1960s. It wasn't because people were being turned away from hospitals. So I think there's a lot of mythology that needs to be debunked as well so people really understand what it meant when, before Medicare and Medicaid existed. Did someone have a question in the back? I know you stood up a couple times. And No, it wasn't the it wasn't the board. It was a, a few certain people in the in, in the certain departments. I think they were resistant because they were, you know, understandably they were doing an operational preparation now, starting to prepare for uh, Ebola possibly happening in in the United States because we had a case in Dallas there, and they really wanted everything to be down the line, and I had they wanted everything to be kind of in the. Um, I guess basically in a command control type of position where they, they would tell you what you would say. You were, they didn't want you to take any questions. They didn't want you to criticize anything or anybody. And they wanted it all to be controlled. And I had this other role as a national spokesperson for the Infectious Disease Society of America. So it kind of was, I had to be freely available and talk about things in very broad generalities for the country as a whole. And it may not have been completely consistent with what this specific hospital was doing. And that caused problems for them. And the fact is that I, it wasn't, some, it's, well, I think if you, you know, the bigger your corporation is, the more bureaucratic it becomes, and it becomes very hard to be innovative and, and, and respond very quickly if you have, you know, six people have to approve a tweet before it can be tweeted. That, that's, not, that's not how you respond to an infectious disease emergency, and that's not how you do crisis communication. You know, the facts, are, I think somebody, I think Johan Brook yesterday said, the facts aren't your enemy, and you need to be, and that's what I, I was being relied upon by people as an outside expert, so they were coming to me for crisis advice. And if I had to go through all that, all of these types of loopholes, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been effective. I wouldn't have been able to do it. That, that, was, that was the issue. And at the end, you know, oddly, you know, I, I did so much media that, the, that the, the White House honored me as like a good communicator. They invited me to the White House for this uh, thing. So it was really interesting because I sent them, I sent uh, my employer an email, said, do you want me to use your title or, my, or just be there as a private citizen now that uh, <laughs> I'm there? But it's, uh, you know, so in the end, there were people that were recognizing what I was doing, and uh, in the end, it all worked out really well with that. But it was just, there were all, my, my point there is that there, even when you're doing the best you can do, there are going to be people there that don't get it, that you're going to have obstacles, that you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to deal with, and, and, it's, and you can't let that completely shatter your whole central purpose and, and make you think that you, you've done something wrong when, you, when maybe you haven't done something wrong. It's important to uh, try to investigate and try to figure out if you've done something wrong, but if you haven't, there are going to be people that are going to be obstacles for you your, your whole life, and you, you, know, you, you try not to think of them, um, to quote the Fountainhead again, but sometimes you, they end up being so, such big obstacles that you, you do have to understand where, what their motivations are and figure out what your best action is in order to they not, they not harm your career. All right, you, you and then you, yeah. Okay, sorry, you said to tell the public that to be, like, as much as you know about it, but what if it was extremely contagious or you didn't want to cause panic? Well, you have to, I, I think that you, you're going to cause much more panic if you don't tell them it's contagious and you're going to make it worse because if you're, if you're telling someone, so the question was, you know, what do you do, what if Ebola was really contagious? You, if it, you're actually, they're coming to you for advice when you're the expert. You want to give them the best advice. So if you tell someone that's not contagious, don't worry about it, don't wear gloves, that's going to make the disease much worse. You know, my goal was to give the best information to control this outbreak and control the hysteria. So I had to give accurate information. So when I said Ebola was deadly and scary, but not very contagious, that was accurate. But if it, when, when I was giving the same advice to people with measles, what if you were around someone with measles? I said, you know, if you're not vaccinated, you're in real danger because that, that's a communicable, a very highly communicable disease. You need to see, you need to call your health department or call your doctor and tell them you might've been exposed to measles. So you, ha you can't, I think it's a misnomer that you think that the American public are going to panic too much if they have too much information. They actually handle it pretty well. Uh, they don't people don't completely lose their head when you give them information, so long as it's accurate and as long as you give them actionable steps. To think about, in the I grew up in the, in the, in the 1980s where we were like, still worried about Soviet uh, nuclear weapons, and we had like, little drills when I was like a first grader, get under your duck and, duck and cover. I mean, that was something that we did. 
that we might get annihilated. We, Nick, as a little first grader, hearing about nuclear winter and stuff like that. And that wasn't panicking us. We knew if we heard these sirens, we'd go underneath our desks and we, and we hide because we might be getting bombed by, by the Soviets. That was something that they did. The American public were well integrated into emergency response. I think in the modern era that people have gotten, you know, this is going to cause widespread panic. But historically, anytime you give people direction, they usually will, uh, they will follow it. And the more information they have, the better they are going to be equipped to deal with it. So that's kind of the philosophy I use when I, when I do crisis communications. In the front. Mm-hmm. And I'm working on a board now where it's basically a bunch of repeat um, non-compliant diabetics and like comorbidities, and they, they don't really care about taking care of themselves and because it's like they can always come back and get it for free because they're on it. Do you think there should be a, like a certain point um, with insurance where they cut off and say you need to actually take care of yourself because you cost too much? I don't know. Yeah, so the question is, you know, when you have really non-compliant patients and they don't take care of themselves and they keep coming back with complications because they haven't followed your directions yet. Like they hide cupcakes underneath their bed, but then they're upset because they have, like, foot sores or they don't feel good or something. Yeah, I mean, the, the general rule I t tell people, you know, medical students or nursing students or anybody, is that you can't save people from themselves. People are going to make bad decisions. You can only offer them, you know, as their health care provider, the best advice that you can give them. But if they have free will, it's their life. If they're going to allow themselves to, to deteriorate, that, that's their, their right to do so if they're an adult. And, you know, it's unfortunate in our system that they, these people can then consume a lot of health care resources because they don't follow the actual prescriptions that they're done. And I think it is very reasonable for an insurance company or an individual health care provider to cut off care when someone has repeatedly not engaged in the relationship that you're supposed to be in. You're the a healthcare provider, this is a patient. They're, they're coming to you presumably for help, and if they're not actually following your advice, then what, uh, what, you're not really doing anything except for wasting everybody's time. So I think it's okay to, it's a, it, I think you have, it's okay to say, you know, you haven't uh, um, uh, followed the direction. I'm getting a time cut off, but thank you.